The Healthy Butcher here. Today we're going to talk about scientifically proven healthy steaks. And for that, I've come to the University of Toronto. A few months ago, I received an email, and attached to that email was an Excel spreadsheet. And what a professor at the University of Toronto had done was go around uh, to various butcher shops and grocery stores in Toronto uh, and bought steaks and then tested them for omega-3s and omega-6s. And so I made my way down here, and I'd like to introduce Professor Richard Bazinet, thanks for having me and thanks for taking the time out of your busy schedule. Thanks, it's a pleasure. So you're a professor in the Department of Nutritional Sciences. Yes, yes. And what's the focus of your research? So I have a bit of a bit different background. I'm, I'm both a, a neuroscientist and a nutritional scientist. And I, I'm really interested in essentially in how we feed the brain from a very basic perspective. And slowly over the time, we've realized that certain fats have to get into your brain. Your brain can't make them. And how do they get into your brain? Well, they get into your brain from your blood. And how do they get into your blood? And the question eventually comes back to nutrition. Right. And it turns out lots of these fats are, are found in, in foods like fish and these kinds of products, and not traditionally in things like beef and some other animals. However, there are exceptions, and, and I think this is why we're here today to talk about it. When, when you get into grass feeding, you can really change the, the composition of these animals yeah. towards fats that end up in your brain. Yeah. So let's let's back up and let's try to uh, get an understanding of fats. Okay. So there's three main types of fat. Yes. Yeah. Saturated, yeah. polyunsaturated, and monounsaturated. Absolutely. So the the one people are probably most familiar with is saturated fat, the one okay. that's a concern for heart disease at, at some level, anyways. And these are the fats that are commonly found in butter, and and the. The general way to, to think about them in terms of the food sources is they're usually solid in, in a room temperature. Okay. Uh, so some of that white fat you'll see on meat, that would be a fairly high saturated fat. The other one is, is monounsaturated fat, and these are typically, the, the most common source of that are things like olive oil. Right. And olive oil is neat if you think about it at room temperature, it's a liquid. Right. But if you ever left the bottle in your fridge or outside, it gets hard. Somebody, it gets hard. So yeah. it's right in that middle state. And then the next big family you have are the, the polyunsaturates. Yeah. And there's two types of those. Uh, there, there's the omega-6s and the omega-3s. And these ones, if you leave them outside, uh, they're fine in, in the winter and, or even in the freezer sometimes. They're always they, liquid. Yeah, they can withstand it. At some temperature, they will freeze. But one, one of the classic examples are fish, which are high in these omega-3s, especially cold water fish. And so it's really important for fish living in very cold conditions that they don't freeze up. So it's one of the neat characteristics of, the, of these fats. And then on the other side, you have the omega-6s. And omega-6s for us uh, in our diets are really coming to, from um, soybean oil and sometimes corn oil or safflower oil, although those are less consumed in, in the food supply. So um, just uh, to, to explain, so we have saturated, monounsaturated, polyunsaturated, and then you start talking about omega-3s and omega-6s. Now those are fatty acids. And so each of, if you break down saturated, monounsaturated, polyunsaturated, you get a whole bunch of, a, a whack of fatty yeah, acids, yeah. right? At, at least 50, 60, 70, 80 fatty acids, depending on how you define it. And they would either be saturated, monounsaturated, or polyunsaturated with omega-6s, right. omega-3s. And then we'd put them together in something often called a triglyceride. And that's what you would see in foods. Right. Uh, and th there'd be a mixture of them in, in, in most uh, food sources. And so when we say a, a a food is saturated. We really just mean it's predominantly saturated. Right, because they contain it's a have mixture a of everything. Of everything. Right. Yeah. So now, why did you choose to measure omega three? So uh, that's linoleic acid. No, alpha linoleic acid and linolenic acid. Close. So the naming's off on this, <laughs> right? So the omega six is called linoleic acid. Okay. And then the omega three is called linolenic acid, and usually we call it alpha linolenic acid because. Terribly, there are multiple linolenic acids, but usually when people say yeah. linolenic, they mean alpha, which is which is the, the main omega-3, and we think about it in, in terms of flax in Canada and uh, canola being some of the major sources. So why did you choose to measure those two acids? Yeah. So I'm very interested in, in those two acids because I think that we get a little too much of the omega-6s in our diets and maybe not enough of the omega-3s. And, and to a certain extent, they, they fight with each other. So you might be getting enough omega-3s, but if you're getting way too much omega-6s. Yeah. Now, they're both essential. They're both essential. So, meaning that we don't actually, our, bat, our bodies cannot produce them. Yes, absolutely. You, you can't make them, you have to get them into your diet. And they're like a vitamin in that respect. Right. But, but the last case of fatty acid deficiency we saw was in 1982. 
and there was a young girl who had a gunshot wound to her stomach, and the the the, the IV feed they put her on was was peculiar for the time, and she developed essential fatty acid deficiency. What's my point? We get more than enough of these, and we're no longer okay. thinking about these in terms of preventing. About deficiency. getting enough. Where we're interested in them yeah. is, is heart health and, and in my interest right. in brain health. And I think we have, the heart health is a bit controversial, but in the brain health we, we have some evidence that the omega-6 is probably not that great for your brain and the omega-3s are the way to go. Yeah. So I'm interested in, in foods because it turns out when, when you analyze beef yeah. from, from what I'll call a commodity supplier, they're, they're predominantly feeding it grain, and maybe you can help me on this. Uh, the word grain really means corn. Yeah, grain and corn, yeah, exactly. Yeah. They're and, kind of intermingled. And as we said, corn oil is, is a real high source of omega-6s. So these cows eat this corn, and they become really good sources of omega-6s and really poor of omega-3s. Yeah. It's actually remarkable. So the, the ratio of these omega-6s to omega-3s in, in a standard piece of beef is about 30 to 1. And that's and that, what we should what should we be aiming for? Well, it's debatable, but some people say ten to one, some people say five to one, and then maybe some people going a little too far saying two to one. Right. But we're somewhere in that range. But yeah. th this product's way outside of that range. Yeah. And it's interesting because you know I, I was raised in the nutritional sciences. I've studied for my life, and that's just how beef is. Right. And then oh, it must have been five, six, seven years ago, uh, a Toronto food writer, Mark Schatzker, showed up and told me I had to analyze these, these exotic steaks he had, and when I started analyzing, the ratios were completely different. Completely different. Completely. Two to one. 30 yeah. to one versus two to one. Yeah. And yeah. that leads us into to our study. So, uh, where so we you went around, so where did, you know, you, you shopped around the city, various butcher shops, grocery stores, and yeah. some local farms. And even some farmers markets and local farms. And then you, and then you tested the ratio of uh, omega-6, omega-3, and, uh, and you know the the thing that makes me proud, and you know, being the owner yeah. of the Healthy Butcher, is that the first, second, and third steak uh, were all from my store, and um, and they were 100% grass fed. So I, I believe the first, uh, well, the second and third place was from First Life Farms. That's the 100% uh, grass fed wagyu that we import from New Zealand. Yes. Uh, now these guys, you know, it's amazing because it's it's a great eating experience because they have. Uh, a perfect Wagyu breed and then they're feeding only grass and you still get amazing marbling so it's a great eating experience and a great ratio because they average it in around 2.5 to 1 yeah. and then the number one the only one that displaced uh, the first light guys from New Zealand is a, a local farm uh, called Pure Island beef in Manitoulin Island and we've done a separate uh, video on their farm and uh, and the great thing about them because prior you know, there are some great farmers in Ontario, but the problem is we deal with a, a huge seasonality yeah. uh, issue where, you know, half the year there is no grass outside. So what what is a grass-fed beef going to eat? And and so Jim and Birgit, the farmers at Pure Island, you know, they have, they take a very scientific approach to it and they cut, they create haylage by cutting grass at its optimal peak in terms of nutrition. And I think that's the result uh, is you get a steak you know, that's Ontario raised, and it was a 1.8 to 1, which is phenomenal. It's like even better than 2 to 1. But, you know, you go down the list, as you go down the list, and you get, you know, it, it, so 1.8 to 1 was the, the best ratio, and it went all the way down to, I think, 36 to 1. You know, what, at what point in time, you know, a lot of these are labeled grass-fed, and some are grain-fed, but at what point in time does it, is there it's no longer, grass is no longer part of the nutritional profile. So, so that's a really important question. And I'm not going to give you the answer, but maybe we can have some insight into yeah. that. So the other thing I did uh, when I went and got these steaks is I asked the person, very simply, I said, is, is, can you give me a grass-fed steak, yes or no? And I took their word for it. Okay? Yeah. I, I didn't, I didn't uh, verify it, right. except I have the instrumentation to measure it. And the one thing that I think was nice is, with one exception, Everybody who said this is a grass-fed product, according to my analysis, was, was reasonably grass-fed. Yeah. Recognizing that there might be some differences, you know, depending on the season and how right. you're getting grass in the winter, getting around that. And then the people who said they were grain-fed were, you know, they were, they were off the charts. They were closer to 30 to 1 as opposed to, you know, 1.8 or 3 yeah. to 1. Big differences. Yeah. One notable exception, one grass-fed, or at least so they told me it was grass-fed, came in at about, I think, 20 to 1. Yeah. And that's not believable. 
frankly, right. based on the analysis yeah. and how many have we done. So, so I don't want to highlight the, the one um, that, that I would say is mislabeled. Yeah. Uh, because most of them, you know, 15 out of 16 were labeled correctly. So it's not too bad. Uh, but it shows we're able, to, we're able to detect that and we're able to detect if somebody's not quite telling the truth. So, so would a consumer be able to detect that? Because frankly, I mean, I, you know, being in the meat industry, I know that there's a lot of suppliers out there that label their 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 beef as grass fed, but it's there is because there is no legislative yeah. uh, control of this term grass fed. It just the fact that they ate grass in their life, you can label them grass fed. It, yeah. it doesn't mean 100% grass fed, and that's the difference. Because as soon as you introduce the grains or the corn into the diet, that that ratio is going to plummet. Yeah. Um, so so, so can a consumer measure this? No, they can't. They have no idea. My equipment's okay. very sophisticated. Uh, it, it costs almost a hundred thousand dollars to get it and set it up, and then you need specialized people to run it, which which right. we can do. But what we can do is we can, we can keep doing this and we can keep testing this. And the idea is, you know, you know, we're a resource here now at the University of Toronto. We, yeah. and if you've got some people you're concerned about, yeah, bring them in. And we'll check them out, and then. It, I think if people realize that there, there are ways that we can check this biochemically, if I can use that right. term, then, then we might have, we, we have uh, a way of enforcing some rules. Yeah. Whatever you know, the people like you and the farmers decide yeah. those rules to be, but, but we have ways to check it. It's too bad that the nutritional box though, doesn't actually split the types of fat. It doesn't actually tell you, uh, you know, what you want to know. It's more generic. Yeah, so as, as customers become uh, better educated on these things, yeah. they, they look at these things and they say, well, wait a second, the information uh, is not there. Is not there. So one of the things we've been doing, and I don't know if we've been successful with this, but when I analyze stuff for a local farmer, I give them the data. I, I give them the results and yeah. we sit down and walk through it. And um, I, I tell them, like, you know, these are your numbers and you can pass this on to, to people like you or, right. or to whoever as consumers might be so they, they know. And I'm also really interested, and I'm, I'm glad you're, you're here to talk about this, because I'm really interested in the effect of season. Yeah. Because um, one of the issues with grass-fed in Canada is our winter. Yeah. You know, how do you do grass-fed yeah. in winter? So I'd like to see the, the effects of season, uh, to see how big of a, a difference this will make. My, if, my guess is that it's not going to make a huge difference, so we're, we're not going to be scoring 1.8 or 2. Maybe we'll be at four or five, but we're never going to get into the 30 or 40s. And I think this will give some information that if we're going to come up with a definition of grass-fed, it's got to be kind of meaningfully uh, and, and in this way chemically verifiably different than than conventional or grain-fed. Yeah, yeah. No, weather definitely plays a huge role. The interesting thing is, though, that uh, that steak, the number one steak, was predominantly winter-fed, so it was eating the haylage that they've okay. created. So they're using very healthy haylage, which is very promising from the, from an Ontario farming perspective. Mm -hmm. so, so certainly I think we can get better than five to one locally speaking. I mean, the New Zealand farms have an unfair advantage. They have green pastures all year round. So it's, it's, it's much easier for them to create you know, these great steaks. Yeah. Well, I learned kind of an embarrassing lesson. I went out to one of the farmer's uh, fields and I, I watched the cows and kind of got an idea what they're doing. And I had this, this, what you think is a brilliant idea as a scientist. And I, I said, I'm going to watch what the cows do. And before they go to the next plot, I'm going to run and grab a piece of grass. And then, you know, it's, it's very ignorant of me. But when I looked down to grab the grass, I saw 20 different plants. Yeah. And, and I, I didn't realize how complicated the grass was. So I, I did my best and I grabbed a handful of what I thought they were grabbing and scientific right. evidences. And then I took that to my lab and I analyzed it. Yeah. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, and it came in at 0 0.3, which is actually the lowest. I don't wow. want people to get confused with ratios, but when you throw a zero in front of it, you're going way down yeah, yeah. and away, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, so it, it was quite remarkable. Um, and there might be opportunities here because because there, that was the average of maybe 20 different plants. Wow! So, so one of those plants might have been 0 0.1, yeah. and might have been, might have one of them might have been one. Yeah. I'd I'd like to figure that out. It'd be nice yeah. to see the effect of season and growing temperatures on this. Grass might be a bit like wine. You know, this this might become a very artistic thing. Yeah, it can, yeah. Uh, for these farmers, yeah. and there could be some opportunities there to to to. The the, the interesting thing, though, you know, one would. Uh, right away jump to the thought that well, well we should just be eating the grass directly but our bodies can't digest grass like the cows can because yeah. of their rumen it's a dis different digestive system right yeah absolutely. so that they're able to extract that those 
oils and that fat from the plants and we wouldn't be able to like what would happen if we were eating directly those types of grasses oh you'd uh, it would go right through you literally go, yeah, yeah. There, there are very special fibers in grass um that, that we don't have the ability we don't have the enzymes to actually digest them at all yeah. but, but they're in the rumen so, yeah. so the rumen can break them down and give the cows the, the nutrients from them yeah. and then take up some of these fats and put them in, into the beef and that's how we get our, nutri our nutrition and it's interesting because I think grass and leaves actually are, are some of the biggest biomasses on the planet right uh, so, so there's a lot of this stuff out there in, in the world to, to feed the animals and, yeah. and uh, we can do it sustainably. I, it's I, far more sustainable than feedlot raised uh, yeah. beef. And so this is out of my expertise, but you know, as a nutritional scientist, I, I think we're, we're we're approaching a new time in nutrition where where people one are concerned about the ethics of animals, and yeah. that's going to be complicated. And, yeah. and, and but you can see some advantages from some of these some of these types of farming systems. Um, but ecology is also making a presence yeah. in nutrition, and for the first time. Nutritional scientists have to worry, I think, about what we say because some things might not be sustainable. And, and so we've got a nutritious project right. and we're interested in the ecology and the ethics of it. And I think consumers are interested in all this. And yeah. it, this might be a, a, an opportunity also for, for some of our local producers. I, yeah, I definitely agree. You know, the, la the last thing I want to talk about, and uh, at the Healthy Butcher, our concentration is on healthy meat. I mean, that's why the name is, is such. Um, not too long ago, the WHO, the World Health Organization, released a study that said that red meat uh, is a probable human carcinogen. So it may be a carcin, you know, may be carcinogenic. Which I'm not even quite certain what the probable means in terms of relative uh, scale. But the the one thing that really bothers me about that study, which is a huge study, is that it brought it just paints a broad stroke across all meats, all red meats. Doesn't matter what animal, and doesn't matter what they ate. And I'm a big believer: you are what you eat, and that applies to the cows as well, and it applies to the lamb, and it applies to the venison, and it applies to everything. I think there's a big difference between meat raised the way nature intended, or animals raised the way nature intended, and animals that are raised in a feedlot. And it, it's unfortunate because I think. The majority of the meat tested for those for those uh, reports are are feedlot beef that have been fed grains and corn yeah. and not the majority. I'd say all of it. Okay. All of it. Yeah, I'm I'm very interested in this also because you know coming from the field of nutrition, if you open up the textbooks and look at nutritional composition of beef, you're finding commodity beef and right. and you would know better than I would uh, what percentage of beef on the actual market in Canada is, is grass fed. Yeah. But I'm assuming it's it's, it's minute. Yeah. If if it's even a percentage, yeah. um, it, it's going to be quite minute. So as nutritionists, this doesn't show up in the, these kind of survey type studies. They're not asking about it and they're not collecting it because because it kind of doesn't matter yeah. because there's not enough people to, to study. Yeah. So I think it's a fair point. And if cancer is one thing, but if we look at the heart disease literature, right. red meat was associated with a risk of heart disease. Then people went and kind of fine-tuned and said, wait a second, it looks like it's highly processed red meat, not so much red meat. Right. Grass-fed meat, nobody's looked at it. Yeah. So all we can do about grass-fed meat is speculate based on its composition yeah. right now. And I say, well, wait a second, it's got more omega-3s, heart disease, probably a good thing, cancer, probably a good thing. It's got less omega-6s. Heart disease, that's controversial, cancer, maybe that's a good thing. Then what I don't study is all of these phytochemicals that are in there. So all these vitamins. Yeah, and that's right. Because I mean, we're just looking at it. You know, we've just been talking about omega threes and omega sixes. But if, if it's healthier in, in in those two fatty acids, what about all the vitamins and yeah. other minerals that it has? And there's some real neat ideas here. One of the ideas is that the these omega threes aren't very stable. So if if you've ever had a bottle of flaxseed oil out on the counter, you, you'll know what I'm talking about. But but the nice thing about all these phytochemicals is they're antioxidants. So they, they come in with the meat at the same time. Right, and protect. And, and they protect it. So I would hypothesize that if you just gave a cow a big source of these omega-3s, they're a very purified source, you could, you could increase the omega-3s in it. But it, you wouldn't get the flavor and you wouldn't get all the benefit and it might not be as stable. But by eating it with the grass, they're getting all these antioxidants and that's a whole package. Yeah. And that's how we think about nutrition. So the, so the predictions would be that that might go a very different way. And what we're hoping by doing some of this research here is to get people interested, 
that, and then you know it's, it's a long process in science. Yeah. I got to get some grants, and we got to try these things, and we got to yeah. we got to look at the clinical studies. You've done other animals as well, not just beef, right? Yeah, so it's been it's been really fun. We we've done uh, I think buffalo. We've done turkey, we've done chicken, we've done geese. And the results are somewhat parallel? What they ate makes all the difference? Always, always in, in the same uh, ballpark. Now things shift a little bit. So milk's a good example, whereas, whereas um, beef, you know, the, the commodity stuff's about 30 to 1. I use that number, it varies a little bit. Commodity milk's only about 6 or 7 to 1. Huh. So it's, it's quite a bit lower. But grass-fed milk is 2 to 1. So, so everything has these differences. Beef is kind of one of the more extreme differences. Right. Uh, but, but some of the birds we've been seeing are really interesting because they are actually taking those omega-3s and moving them down uh, the pathway, not getting too complicated. And they're starting to turn some of the omega-3s into omega-3s that we only think about that are in fish. Oh, wow. And that's really interesting. And, and I, we've done the analysis, and I can say that um, some chickens that I've analyzed, these pasture chickens, heritage chickens that are pasture raised, have more fish omega threes in them than than farm tilapia. Wow! Which I don't, I don't think I think consumers would be surprised when, yeah. they're, when they're going to the fishmonger to buy a source of fish because they think it's good for them. And, and there could be a chicken, although very hard to get. Uh, yeah, to, to purchase. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Pasture raised at, at this time that that would actually, from a fatty acid profile, be superior to that piece of. Fish. I think I've, I've taken enough of your time. I want to thank you, not just for taking the time today, but also for taking it upon yourself to do tests of uh, stakes throughout the city and for just pushing it along, because I think what you're doing is bringing light to an area of nutrition that we need more light uh, shined on. So I, I just uh, thank you for your work that you're doing, and I hope you continue it, and, and I hope you continue to get grants to continue to do the research. Well, thank you. Like I said, we're building this up, and uh, you know, hopefully uh, your consumers or customers are seeing this, and. If they've got questions, I, I'd encourage them to look me up and, and contact me because, you know, I, I, I'm not a farmer, right? I'm a scientist, and I, and I don't understand all these systems. But I'm, I'm always really interested in how the more I learn about this, there are people right around the corner from us, right here in Ontario, doing really unique things. Yeah. And uh, I, I'd, I'd be happy to analyze their samples to see if we can give them any information. It's amazing. Thank you, Richard. You're welcome. Thank you.